Did you know that some of the scariest cults in history were led by women? These cults were not only mysterious, but also dangerously powerful. Dive with us into the mysteries of these female-only cults. Our first case study takes us to the eerie corridors of the Radha Swami Satsang Beast Cult. The story of this cult is steeped in mystery, a tale of devotion, power, and a charismatic female leader who held the reins of this secretive society. The Radha Swami Satsang Beast Cult, also known as RSSB, had its roots in the late 19th century in India. Its founder, Yaimal Singh, passed the torch to a lineage of male spiritual leaders. But it was the enigmatic female leader, who assumed power in the late 20th century, that truly transformed the RSSB into the cult we know today. This woman, shrouded in secrecy, was revered as the embodiment of the divine. Her followers saw her as a living saint, a beacon of enlightenment in a world of darkness. The cult's practices were centered around the female leader's teachings, which were a unique blend of mysticism, spirituality, and secrecy. The leaders of RSSB preached a doctrine of inner light and sound, encouraging their followers to detach from the material world and embark on a journey within themselves. But the cult was not just about spirituality. It had its own unique set of customs and rituals. Secretive meetings were held under the cloak of night, where the female leader would share her divine wisdom with her loyal followers. The members were known to maintain a strict vegetarian diet. But like all things that rise, the Radha Swami Satsang Bayas cult too had to face a downfall. The cult's secretive nature and the absolute power wielded by the female leader began to raise eyebrows. Allegations of financial fraud, illegal land acquisitions, and even murder began to surface, and legal action was taken against them. The downfall of the cult was swift and brutal. The once revered female leader was now a fugitive on the run from the law. The followers were left disillusioned, their world shattered. The RSSB was no longer the beacon of enlightenment it once was. It was now a symbol of betrayal and deceit. The story of the Radha Swami Satsang Beast cult serves as a chilling reminder of the dangers of blind faith and unchecked power. It's a tale that echoes through the corridors of history a warning to those who dare to tread the path of the cult. The downfall of the Radha Swami Satsang Bias cult was as mysterious as its rise. The story of this cult is but a single chapter in the vast book of history, a book filled with tales of devotion, power, and the darker side of human nature. Next, we delve into the chilling world of the Order of the Solar Temple cult. This sinister tale unfolds in the mid-70s in the heartland of Geneva, Switzerland, where Luc Jure, a charismatic public speaker, and Joe DiMambro, a mystical-minded homemaker, co-founded the cult. DiMambro, the female co-leader, claimed to have psychic powers and was believed to be in contact with ancient spiritual entities. The Order of the Solar Temple was not your run-of-the-mill cult. It was an eclectic mix of Christian doctrine, UFO mythology, and New Age spirituality. The members believed themselves to be reincarnations of the Knights Templar, the medieval Christian military order. They saw their mission as protecting the world from the apocalypse they believed was imminent. Their practices were a blend of bizarre and terrifying. Rituals involved ceremonial robes, swords, and the use of secret codes. However, their belief in the apocalypse was not just theoretical. They believed that life on Earth was an illusion and that true life began after death. This belief led to a series of horrifying mass suicides orchestrated by the leaders as a means to transition to a new life on a mythical planet revolving around the star Sirius. The first of these mass suicides occurred in October 1994, with the death of 53 members in Switzerland and Canada. These were not quiet, peaceful passings, rather, they were violent and brutal, involving poison, firearms, and even immolation. In the years that followed, more members would transition in similar gruesome circumstances. The downfall of the Order of the Solar Temple cult was as dramatic as its existence. The world watched in horror as the news of the mass suicides broke. The legal action that followed was swift and severe. In the end, the Order of the Solar Temple cult serves as a grim reminder of the manipulation and coercion that can lead individuals to forsake their lives for a distorted vision of salvation. It is a chilling testament to the dark side of human faith and the lengths some will go to in pursuit of their beliefs. The order of the solar temple cult ended in tragedy and mystery. Finally, 
we explore the mystery of the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God Cult. A chilling name for a chilling group, this cult was born in the heartland of Uganda in the late 1980s. The birth of this cult can be traced back to a woman named Credonia Morinde, a former prostitute who claimed to have been visited by the Virgin Mary. With her compelling charisma and persuasive powers, she became the co-leader of this cult, alongside Joseph Kibwadir, a former politician. Like most cults, the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God had a unique doctrine. They held a stringent interpretation of the Ten Commandments, believing that by strictly adhering to these divine laws, they would be saved from eternal damnation. Their practices ranged from the mundane, such as banning soap and sex, to the extreme, like forbidding speech to avoid breaking the commandment against lying. Life within the cult was austere and disciplined, every moment meticulously planned and every action carefully monitored. But the most chilling aspect of this cult was their belief in the imminent end of the world. Convinced that the apocalypse was near, they began preparing for the end. This preparation took a horrifying turn in the year 2000, when the cult's leadership ordered a series of mass suicides. Over 700 members, men, women, and children perished in a series of fires and poisonings. It was a gruesome scene that shocked the world and marked a tragic end to the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. The aftermath of this horrific event brought the cult's activities under the scrutiny of law enforcement. Investigations revealed that the cult leaders had been living in luxury, a stark contrast to the austere lifestyle enforced on their followers. Further digging unveiled a series of murders and disappearances connected to the cult, suggesting that the mass suicide might have been a cover-up for these heinous acts. Legal action followed, but the cult's leaders, including Credonia Morinda, had vanished without a trace. Some believe they perished in the mass suicide, others speculate they are still at large living under assumed identities. The truth remains a mystery, adding another layer of intrigue to this chilling tale. The movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God cult left a chilling legacy. It serves as a stark reminder of the dark corners of human belief and the lengths people will go to maintain their faith, even when it leads to destruction. Travel back to ancient Greece, where the Pythia, or Oracle of Delphi, held sway. This was a time when women were seldom seen in positions of power, but the Pythia were the exception. They were revered by all, their words held in high regard, their prophecies shaping the course of nations and the fate of kings. The Pythia were a group of women chosen to serve as the high priestesses of Apollo at Delphi, the center of the Greek world. They were selected from the local populace, often older women of blameless life who were believed to be pure vessels for the god's voice. The Pythia would enter a trance-like state, induced by the vapors rising from a chasm beneath the temple. Once in this state, she would deliver her prophecies, often in a cryptic or ambiguous manner. These utterances were then interpreted by the temple priests, who relayed them to the inquiring individuals or city-states. The influence of the Pythia was immense. Their prophecies could provoke wars, end feuds, or inspire great works of art and literature. They were consulted before major undertakings, from the founding of colonies to the strategy of battles. Their words were considered the will of Apollo, and thus were treated with the utmost respect and reverence. Despite this power, the Pythia lived a life of seclusion and ritual. They were bound by strict rules, from their diet to their attire, which maintained their purity and connection to the god. Their identities were stripped away, replaced by the title of Pythia, making them the faceless voice of divine wisdom. Over time, the reputation of the Pythia waned. Accusations of bribery and political manipulation tainted their image, and the rise of rational thought in Christianity led to a decline in their influence. Yet, their legacy endures, a testament to a time when women's voices echoed with the power of the divine. Thus, the Pythia were revered, their words held in high regard by all. They stand as a powerful symbol of female authority in a world dominated by men. Their history a fascinating tale of mystery, power, and divine inspiration. Fast forward to the medieval times where a group of women known as the Beguines formed a spiritual community. Picture this. It's the 13th century in Europe. Amidst the chaos of the times, a collective of devout women rose, set apart from the societal norms. They were called the Beguines. These ladies were neither nuns nor married women. 
but they chose a life dedicated to God without taking any formal religious vows. The Beguines lived together in large communities known as Beguinages. These were essentially self-sustaining mini-cities within cities, with their own churches, hospitals, and businesses. Their lifestyle was communal, but each Beguin maintained her own personal autonomy. They could leave the Beguinage at any time, even to marry. But what really set the Beguines apart was their mystic practices. They believed in the direct personal experience of God. Their spirituality was deeply introspective, with a focus on meditation, prayer, and contemplation. Their writings, filled with visions and spiritual insights, are considered some of the earliest examples of women's literature in the vernacular. The Beguines were ahead of their time. They were educated women who studied theology, scripture, and philosophy. They provided for the sick and the poor, and taught children. These actions left a significant mark on society. However, their radical ways also attracted suspicion and criticism. The church and secular authorities were threatened by these independent, literate women who dared to live outside the traditional roles of wife or nun. Despite the challenges, the Beguines persisted. Their influence spread across Europe, from France to Germany, and even as far as Poland and Hungary. They left a legacy of female empowerment and spiritual exploration that continues to inspire today. The Beguines were not a cult in the traditional sense. They didn't follow a charismatic leader, nor did they hold bizarre beliefs. But they were a sisterhood that lived on the fringes of society, guided by a mystic spirituality that was misunderstood and feared by many. The Beguines, they lived in their own world, a world that still intrigues historians. Now let's traverse to the 19th century where the Fox sisters ignited the spiritualism movement. In the quiet town of Hydesville, New York, lived three young girls, Margaret, Kate, and Leah Fox. The year was 1848 when the sisters claimed they could communicate with the spirits. Their house became a hub of otherworldly communication with mysterious rappings and knocks that the sisters insisted were messages from the beyond. This was a time when Americans were seeking solace and answers in the face of death, and the Fox sisters provided a glimmer of hope. Their seances filled with clairvoyant revelations and ghostly interactions drew in the curious and the grieving alike. Their fame spread far and wide, sparking the spiritualism movement, a wave that swept across America and beyond. The Fox sisters were not just mediums, they were the pioneers of spiritualism. They laid the groundwork for an entire belief system that suggested the living could communicate with the spirits. They gave hope to those grieving, assuring them that their loved ones were not gone but merely existing in a different realm. However, as the saying goes, all that glitters is not gold. The Fox sisters' glittering fame was tarnished by skepticism and scandal. Doubts arose about the authenticity of their seances. Their mysterious rappings were suspected to be clever tricks, not spiritual communications. The sisters' fall from grace was swift and brutal. Margaret and Kate eventually confessed to fraud, stating that their spiritual communications were nothing more than well-practiced hoaxes. But despite their confession and the ensuing scandal, the spiritualism movement did not die with the Fox sisters. Their influence was so profound that spiritualism continued to flourish, even in the face of skepticism and scandal. Today, spiritualism has evolved into various forms, and there are still those who believe in the possibility of communicating with spirits. The Fox Sisters, the pioneers of spiritualism, a movement that still has followers today. In the late 1960s, a sinister cult emerged, led by Charles Manson, but largely composed of women. This was the Manson family, a cult that would go on to shock the world with its brutal crimes and strange practices. The women of the Manson family, often referred to as the Manson girls, were central to the cult's operations. Manson, a charismatic but deeply troubled individual, managed to manipulate these young women, many of whom were looking for a sense of belonging or purpose. He convinced them that he was a messiah-like figure, and they followed him blindly, dedicating their lives to his cause. The Manson family lived communally, often in squalid conditions, on an old movie ranch near Los Angeles. They embraced a lifestyle that rejected societal norms, turning to drugs, sex, and ultimately violence. The women were expected to be subservient to Manson and the other men in the group, fulfilling their every demand without question. The Manson family women were not just passive participants in this cult, however. They played a key role in some of the most notorious crimes of the 20th century, including the infamous 
Tate LaBianca murders. These women under Manson's influence committed horrific acts of violence that resulted in the deaths of seven people over the course of two nights. These crimes shocked society, leading to widespread fear and a media frenzy. The Manson family women became infamous, their names synonymous with the dark side of the 1960s counterculture. Their trials were highly publicized, with many of the women expressing no remorse for their actions. The impact of the Manson family women continues to resonate today. They serve as a stark reminder of the dangers of charismatic leaders and the power they can hold over their followers. They also highlight the vulnerability of those who are lost or searching, and how they can be manipulated into committing unthinkable acts. The Manson family women, a chilling example of how cults can lead to horrifying outcomes. Their story is a dark chapter in the annals of cult history, one that serves as a cautionary tale of manipulation, violence, and the power of persuasion. In the 1990s, a cult known as the Order of the Solar Temple led many, including women, to their tragic ends. This cult, founded by Luc Jure and Joseph de Mambro, was not exclusively female but women played a significant role in its operations and, ultimately, its tragic demise. The Order of the Solar Temple was rooted in a blend of Christian UFO and New Age philosophies. These teachings led followers to believe in the imminent end of the world and their ascension to a new life on a mythical planet. The leaders proclaimed themselves as spiritual and temporal masters, and the followers, including the women, were convinced of their divine authority. Women in the Order of the Solar Temple were seen as equal participants, sharing in the same rituals and teachings as their male counterparts. They were not merely followers, but active contributors to the life of the cult. Their devotion and belief in the leaders' prophecies were instrumental in the cult's growth and influence. But the cult's belief in the end of the world took a dark turn. The leaders convinced their followers that they needed to transition to this new life through a ritual of death. In the mid-90s, over 70 members of the cult, men and women alike, were found dead in Switzerland, France, and Canada. It was a mass suicide orchestrated by the leaders. The women of the Order of the Solar Temple were not mere pawns. They were active participants in the cult's rituals, believers in its prophecies, and victims of its tragic end. Their involvement and their demise serve as a stark reminder of the power of belief and the dangers of manipulation. The Order of the Solar Temple, a grim reminder of the dangers of cult involvement. These tragic events show us that the allure of such groups can affect anyone, regardless of gender, and remind us of the importance of critical thinking and the courage to question authority. In the depth of history, these female-only cults have left indelible marks. Our journey through these enigmatic societies has been riveting, hasn't it? Let's take a moment to recap the fascinating world we've explored. We began with the Oracle of Delphi, where the Pythia held sway. This high priestess, fueled by intoxicating vapors, spoke in riddles and prophecies, and her words held immense power over the ancient world. She was a beacon of divine wisdom, an embodiment of the god Apollo himself. Her influence was such that no significant decision in Greece was made without her counsel. Next, we delved into the Middle Ages with the Beguines, a group of pious women who defied societal norms to live in communal simplicity, dedicating themselves to prayer and charity. Their mystic spirituality, while controversial, left a lasting impact on Christian theology. They were autonomous, self-sustaining, and their communities thrived, even in the face of adversity. Then we journeyed to the 19th century, where the Fox sisters sparked the spiritualist movement. These three young women claimed to communicate with the dead using mysterious rappings and knockings. Their seances became a sensation, attracting the curious and the desperate, forever changing the landscape of belief in the supernatural. We also explored the darker side of cults with the Manson family women. These young women, under the spell of the charismatic Charles Manson, participated in heinous crimes that shocked the world. Their story serves as a chilling reminder of the power of manipulation and the dangerous allure of charismatic leaders. Lastly, we visited the tragic tale of the Order of the Solar Temple. This cult, cloaked in a blend of Christianity and UFO beliefs, ended in a horrific mass suicide. The female followers, devoted to the point of death, highlight the extreme lengths some are willing to go in their pursuit of spiritual fulfillment. Each of these groups, from the Pythia to the Order of the Solar Temple, 
played significant roles in their respective eras. They challenged societal norms, pushed boundaries, and left lasting impacts. Their stories are a testament to the power of belief, the strength of women, and the allure of the unknown. Remember, history isn't just about kings and wars, it's also about the mysterious, the obscure, and the female-only cults that have shaped our world in ways we can't even fathom.